Welcome back to Bad Things in History, where the narrator would like to hear a good thing in history that comes to your mind, just to shake things up. Our series examining the worst and mostly forgotten events of the 1970s continues. In this episode, we explore the chaos of 1977. The end of the decade was fast approaching, but death and destruction continued to spread at an ever-increasing pace. And for some unknown reason, this was a popular year for explosions. Our first story is about a bombing in Moscow. Moscow Bombings The Soviet Union was under oppressive communist rule during the 1970s. One of the positive results of this type of government was a low crime rate. It was believed that events like terrorist attacks only happened in capitalist countries. However, it would turn out that the Soviet government was lying to their citizens. On the evening of January 8, 1977, several attacks rocked the city of Moscow. They occurred within 40 minutes of each other. First, a bomb exploded during rush hour in a metro train. 30 minutes later, another bomb went off at a grocery store. Five minutes after that, another bomb placed outside the store also exploded. Seven people were killed in the blasts, and 37 more were injured. The public was not told about the event. As investigators interviewed more than 500 witnesses, they were unable to determine who carried out the attack. On November 2, 1977, the terrorists tried to strike again. They left a bomb at a train station. However, the batteries on the timer stopped working. The bomb didn't explode and police were able to study the device. It led them to believe that three Armenian separatists were behind the bombings. The three men were arrested and put on trial. The trial was conducted in secret and the Armenians were found guilty. They were sentenced to death. The death sentence was carried out on January 29, 1978. Alexander Tarasov was a Soviet dissident who advocated for a free press. He began to suspect that the three Armenians may have been framed. Alexander thought that the Soviet government arranged the terrorist bombings to discredit the dissident movement. In an article from January 1977, he said, I cannot rid myself of the hunch that the explosion in the Moscow underground and the tragic deaths of individuals are a new provocation on the part of the organs of repression, and the most dangerous of recent years. Precisely this hunch and the fears connected with it that this provocation could lead to changes in the whole internal climate of the country have prompted me to write this article. I would be very glad if my thoughts turned out to be wrong. The Soviet people were not told of the terrorist attacks until February 8, 1979. Washington, D.C. Attack Even the United States Capitol wasn't safe from violence in the 1970s. In addition to terrorism, religious extremism was also on the rise. Ernest Timothy McGee was born in Gary, Indiana in 1921. He joined the U.S. Army as a young adult, but was eventually dismissed due to mental instability. Luckily for Ernest, he was a talented drummer. He made a living for the next several years playing with successful jazz artists such as Billie Holiday and Charlie Parker. Around 1954, Ernest changed his name to Hamas Abdul Khalis and joined the Nation of Islam. It was a black Muslim group dedicated to spreading its religion to African Americans in the United States. But in 1958, Hamas decided that he no longer agreed with the policies of the Nation of Islam. So he created his own rival group known as the Hanafi Movement. Elijah Muhammad was the leader of the Nation of Islam. In 1972, Hamas published an open letter which called Elijah a liar and a fraud. The accusations drew unwanted attention. On January 17, 1973, seven men from the Nation of Islam arrived at the home where Hamas and his followers lived. Hamas wasn't there, so the gunman decided to kill his family instead. Five children were drowned and two others were shot to death. The murderers were arrested and convicted, but Hamas Abdul Khalis was not satisfied. He felt the government failed by not holding the Nation of Islam accountable as well. 
On March 9, 1977, Hamas and several members of his group entered the headquarters of B'nai B'rith in Washington, D.C. It was a Jewish organization which attempted to assist other members of the Jewish faith. But on this day, it was a source of over 100 hostages. Within the next hour, members of the assault team also had captured the district building, which was a few blocks from the White House. They also captured the Islamic Center of Washington. As the attackers entered the top floor of the district building, they mistakenly thought they were under attack. The assailants began firing and killed two people. Marion Barry, who would one day become mayor of Washington, D.C., was injured in the exchange. Hamas then issued several demands. He wanted the men who murdered his family to be delivered to him so that he could kill them. He also wanted the murderers convicted of killing Muslim leader Malcolm X. Additionally, he requested a visit from boxer Muhammad Ali. When Hamas was informed that people all around the country were worried about the hostages, his response was not sympathetic. Get on the phone and call President Carter and some of those senators that never sent a call a condolence message. Do you not realize when my family was wiped out, no one said one word? Not one. Not even a preacher. Not even a minister. Not even a spiritual advisor. Not even a city council member. So I'm very glad you're worried now. When they wiped out my family, I didn't hear about your sympathy and emotions. I got a letter the other day from my brother telling me how the brother was swaggering around in jail. The killer of Malcolm walking around with guards protecting him. Well, tell him it's over. Tell him it's payday. The demands were never met by the United States government. In the meantime, ambassadors from several Muslim countries spoke with Hamas and urged him to surrender. This included representatives from Iran, Pakistan, and Egypt. On March 11th, Hamas Abdul Khalis surrendered. He was put on trial and given a sentence of 120 years. He died in prison on November 13th, 2003. Beverly Hills Supper Club Fire In addition to bombings and murder, 1977 also contained one of the deadliest fires in history. The Beverly Hills Supper Club was located in Southgate, Kentucky. It was less than three miles from Cincinnati, Ohio, so people from both Kentucky and Ohio frequently visited the establishment. The club first opened in 1926 as an illegal gambling location. The famous singer and actor Dean Martin was even a blackjack dealer there at one time. However, by the end of the 1960s, the building was no longer attracting patrons. In 1971, the club was purchased by new owners. Renovations were made to expand the size of the building and ensure it could hold more visitors. Although the modifications made the interior visually appealing, it was a collection of hazards waiting for unsuspecting victims. The inside of the building was modified such that anyone in the center of it would have to walk through several small corridors to reach any of the exits. During the renovations, nobody bothered to add sprinklers or any fire suppression systems. And the carpet was also made of extremely flammable material. On the evening of May 28, 1977, the Beverly Hills Supper Club contained perhaps as many as 2,000 people. It was only rated to safely hold 600. One of the reasons people were so eager to attend that night was because actor John Davidson was there. He was known for hosting television shows such as That's Incredible and Hollywood Squares. Other visitors simply wanted to enjoy the gourmet cuisine offered at the club. Around 9 p.m., someone noticed a fire in one of the rooms. An attempt was made to extinguish the flames, but it was unsuccessful. The building didn't have a fire alarm, so employees began moving to other rooms and asked everyone to evacuate. Then the power went out. People panicked and began pushing against each other, but every exit except one was blocked by flames. The crowd began crushing each other with greater urgency. Those who were outside the building tried to help by pulling people through the door, but soon the victims were packed so tightly that nobody could be removed. More than a hundred firefighters tried to put out the deadly fire. They failed to make a difference. One of the volunteer firefighters described the scene. When I got to the inside doors, which is about 30 feet inside the building, I saw these big double doors and people were sacked like cordwood. 
They were clear up to the top. They just kept diving out on each other, trying to get out. I looked back over the pile of... It wasn't dead people. There were dead and alive in that pile. And I went in and I just started to grab them two at a time and pulled them off the stack and dragged them out. It took two days for the fire to finally burn itself out. In the end, 165 people died. The source of the fire was determined to be faulty wiring. Victims and their families also filed one of the first class action lawsuits ever brought in response to a disaster. The final settlement was $55.4 million. The Nazi that escaped Sometimes even war criminals have family members that love them. Herbert Kappler was born in Stuttgart, Germany on September 23, 1907. He was from a middle-class family, but in 1931 he decided to improve his social standing by joining the Nazi party. By 1933, he was a member of the SS, the Nazi paramilitary organization. In 1938, Herbert helped supervise the mass deportation of Jews from Austria. The following year, he was sent to Rome to represent the interests of the Nazi party. On September 8, 1943, Italy signed an armistice with the Allies and agreed to stop attacking them. In response, the German military occupied Rome. Herbert Kapler was appointed to head the military police in the city. On March 23, 1944, a group of Italian resistance fighters ambushed a German battalion with an explosive device. The fighters disappeared and couldn't be found. In response, Adolf Hitler told Herbert that he should kill 10 Italian citizens for every German that was murdered. So on March 24, Herbert had 335 prisoners taken to a cave. The prisoners were marched into the caverns in groups of five, then shot in the head. When finished, a bomb was detonated, which collapsed the cave and buried the bodies. This event became known as the Ardeatine Massacre. Herbert Kappler was arrested by British authorities in 1945. In 1948, he was sentenced to life in prison. His first wife divorced him, but Herbert began corresponding with a nurse named Annalise. In 1972, he married her in a prison wedding ceremony. In 1975, he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Both Annalise and the West German government asked for Herbert to be released. The Italian government refused, but they did allow him to transfer from prison to a hospital. As the cancer progressed, Herbert's weight dropped to 105 pounds. Since Annalise was a nurse, she was given almost unlimited access to him. She decided that her husband would not die in Italy. In August 1977, she stuffed the dying war criminal into a suitcase and carried him out of the hospital. The pair then escaped to West Germany. The West German government refused to return Herbert to Italy. The cancer finally took his life on February 8, 1978. Grain Elevator Explosion among the strange and deadly events of 1977 was a horrific agricultural disaster. Right outside of New Orleans was the West We Go Continental Grain Elevators. These large structures were hundreds of feet tall and were filled with grain from the recent fall harvest. Around 9.10 a.m. on December 22nd, the residents of New Orleans were startled by a loud, thundering explosion. Spectators claimed to see a giant fireball shoot up from the grain elevators. A few moments later, debris began falling on homes all over New Orleans. Firefighters spent days digging through the rubble. They found 11 survivors. By the time rescue efforts were finished, it was determined that 36 people died in the explosion. It would turn out that this week was a very bad time for the grain industry. There were additional explosions in Wayne City, Illinois as well as Tupelo, Mississippi, and Galveston, Texas. Investigators suspected there was a single cause for all the explosions. Grain creates flammable dust. Static electricity, or even someone lighting a cigarette, can sometimes be enough to ignite the particles. In 1978, new guidelines and regulations were created to try and stop grain explosions in the future. The West We Go grain elevator explosion is still the worst grain-related disaster in United States history. 
Murders, bombings, prison escapes, and agricultural disasters were just a few of the unpleasant events from 1977. But there is far more suffering and death than we could explore in this episode. What do you think about the horrible events from this terrible year? Did we miss anything important? Tell us what you think about it in the comments. Normally, this is the part where we ask you to subscribe and beg for donations. We'll skip it this time. But you could show your appreciation by watching another episode. Thank you for watching Bad Things in History.